Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Rolf Jacobson. And me, Joy J. Moore. The texts for the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on August 16th, 2020, are these, the first reading or the Old Testament reading, the complementary Old Testament reading is Isaiah 56, verses 1, 6, 7, and 8. The semi-continuous first reading, Old Testament reading, is Genesis 45, 1 through 15, Psalm 67, Romans 11, 1 through 2a and 29 through 32, and from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 15, 21 through 28, but you're going to want to read 10 through 20 as well, which is permitted and encouraged, no doubt. Great story here in Matthew. Of Great pair of stories. It's a shame they aren't two separate lections, two separate Sundays, but you can do them both at once. Caroline, well, that, what do you think? Well, that was one of the questions I was going to raise because uh, because you do have ten to twenty in brackets, and so the immediate, usually the immediate question for preachers is: Do we include those verses or not? How do they relate to? 21 to 28. Uh, aren't these really two different texts? Do I preach two different sermons? So all kinds of things with regard to uh, with regard to those two passages uh, side by side. So I think one thing we want to uh, maybe address on the front end is uh, what are the, what are the connection? What are the connections? What are the uh, possible homiletical directions that you could take in, in linking these two stories together? that seem uh, rather disparate. Well, in one way you have to go back to the feeding of the 5,000 plus in, in, in the sense of images of abundance and even maybe the parable of the sower, but images of abundance that are starting to course throughout the gospel, which the so-called Canaanite woman seems to understand intuitively somehow that there is enough blessing to go around in this ministry, even a ministry that Jesus thinks is rather narrowly defined uh, in, in, in what he's going to do, which again, he did this back when he commissioned his own followers to go out. He said, only go to, to, to Jewish villages. And that's one of the things that's shocking about the Canaanite woman's retort is she is pressing up, not necessarily against virtues of fairness or niceness. She's pushing against Jesus' understanding of the limits of his ministry as he understands it and is saying, look, pal, shouldn't say pal, but that's another way of translating curie. Look, pal, there's enough here to go around in this ministry. And I'm not asking for a special status or a special seat at the table. I just recognize that there's enough here to heal my daughter. And that's, that gets interpreted by him as it's it's great to, uh, to see st sticking with that second story. You know, uh, uh, this is sort of like a John four versus John three connection in the sense that last week we had the disciples who all have names. They're all insiders. They're Jewish, and they have little faith. Oh, ye've little faith. And now here you've gone across the lake right to Gennesaret. Um, so you're in the land of the, the Gentiles. She's a Gentile, she's a woman. She doesn't have a name, but she has great faith. This is why I think that the um, other story is before it. It's a safer text, uh, especially uh, in um, the uh, suggestions that are made up in your reading, Matt, uh, and also in the commentary. Uh, and this is uh, always a difficult text for me um, because it's real hard for me as a woman of color to read Jesus as a screw up. And for me, sexist ethnocentrism is a screw up. And it's real hard for me to get to the lordship of someone that needs me to tell him that I'm created in the image of the God he claims to be the son of. And uh, so I, I ask folks to be careful when they're reading this text. Um, I like to read it, and, and people say I'm defending God or defending Jesus with this reading, but I like to read it to say that like God knew Job's heart better than Job knew God, uh, his own, that Jesus is actually not talking 
down to the woman, he's voicing the um, prejudices of the onlookers, of the disciples. And he's saying what's in their heart when they say, you know, tell her to go away, shut her up. And, and, and he's basically voicing it and she gets it. She knows that God's faithfulness to Israel is the blessing to everyone else. And if Jesus isn't keeping God's promise first to Israel to therefore be the blessings to everyone else, then how can the rest of us trust this God? So I'm getting a little uh, worked up on it, but this text is, uh, I think that, that the beginning of the text is a way out of avoiding the fact that this is a hard text that uh, might cause us to say to our congregation, what blindness are you following? That's the offense that never goes away. The offense of not now or no to the healing goes away. The offense of him calling her a dog and she even kind of takes up that image and extends it, like plays with the image, which is forever a disturbing aspect of this. There's, there's perhaps, I'll add to your, um, your list about how this is ethnicity-based, perhaps gendered as well. There's also some class distinctions here. If he's in Tyre and Sidon where at least outside of Tyre, where Jewish communities were much poorer than the Gentiles, often victims of persecution various times from the people in Tyre. And so it's hard to say who she is because technically there are no more Canaanites at this point in history. I mean, where exactly, how she identifies isn't totally clear, but she might be viewed by him as kind of an oppressor class and he's on her turf. So there's all sorts of stuff you know, swirling around in there about, about difference and other and, and resentment. And we don't quite always know where to land that. So thanks for answering that too. It's interesting Sorry, I talked to over me. you, Caroline, I thought. No, I, I was going to say that the, yeah, the, well, to uh, expand on what you just said, Matt, the biases here, the, you know, the exposure of biases are numerous, cultural, ethnic, political, economic, religious. I mean, you've got them all <laughs> here and the way in which, uh, and I think it, I think it does offer a lens in which the way in which our biases are the way in which our, uh, it, which is one of the connections to the first part of the passage, how the, the way and how do we understand our internal commitments uh, and, and what, we, what we say we believe and what we say to what we are committed, but does that actually get, that, what does that look like on the outside? How does that get manifested? What are the external reactions or what are our external behaviors that, that match those internal commitments? And I think that's in part what this woman is doing here is that she's saying, uh, you know, in part saying to Jesus, does your external, will your external behavior match your internal, you know, your internal commitment or what biases are you going to follow through with? Uh, but it's also the way in which Jesus is calling that out um, uh, prior to that. And so it's, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's a way to, you know, it's a way to talk about that in terms of, of calling it, which really goes back, you know, in part going back to the overall theme in Matthew of, if you say you're my disciple, then this is what it looks like. Uh, it, it, this, is, this is what it has to look like. Go back to Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And, uh, and there's, there's, this, there's a distinctiveness that makes you, uh, to whom you are committed is going to look like something from the outside. Uh, and that's part of, um, which I think is a, a really critical theme uh, right now for people to to think about with regards to their own uh, the ways in which uh, the ways in which our commitments whether we know them or not whether we like them or not we all have biases as whether or not we admit them uh, we all have ideologies as whether or not we're actually you know willing to to uh, do some self analysis and self uh, self reflection uh, what happens when those are exposed and. Uh, what will we uh, what will we do with that reality? So I think it could be a, I think it could could be a really important exploration into uh, into some of those uh, key components of of who we are. I'm really interested in the um, the first words she says to Jesus. Um, Have mercy on me, Lord, Son of David. Um, that Son of David 
is again a messianic title um lord kyria could be or not right it could sometimes it's translated to sir but in this case it seems to be lord son of david that um so what do you uh, matt uh matt and caroline especially uh as new testament people what do you make of that here that this canaanite woman refers to jesus with this very insider um jewish title well i think in part there's some irony here right that she names the truth of who jesus is at least according to matthew uh and so if you go back to you know if you go back to matthew's genealogy and the way in which uh the way in which matthew takes great pains to put jesus into that lineage uh of of, of an heir of an ancestor of david i think that's part of it you know you have here you have a you know here you have an outsider or someone who shouldn't recognize who jesus is uh does and and to what extent it's off of that knowledge or off of that recognition that she says well if you are the son of david then <laughs> then this is this is what you should be able to do or this is who sh this is how you're this is uh this is how you should be or this is what i should be able to expect from you and so uh that's that's how i in part uh take that title in particular when it comes to the gospel of matthew matt uh, i agree yeah the 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 lord whether it mean the the, the expression curie whether it means sir or lord is is probably irrelevant because it probably means both or there is a, a double meaning it probably means more than what she recognizes it means the son of david is a curious title for a canaanite to use david wasn't the one who led the charge against the canaanites that was before his time but if i'm right david was still doing kind of mop-up operations against canaanite groups was he not yeah well he was a yeah he yeah he he killed a lot of canaanites so it's interesting that she would use that term as opposed to son of God or son of the most high or any other type of expression that there is a sense of subordination in what she asks, which is interesting, which if this is where you can see, I prefer the Markin story a lot more than the Bethian one here. If this is a woman who has significant standing, social standing in Tyre or Sidon, then it becomes interesting as well. If again, this is really far away from Jesus' home turf. He's the outsider here. He's the powerless one in this cultural setting. And so if this is her addressing him as a kind of representative of conquered people, that becomes an interesting, I don't know what it is. It could be humility. It could be a kind of, of humiliation that I'm less comfortable with, but something's going, there's, there's, there's enough going on here about power. You're not exactly sure who has it and who doesn't and who's being rude and who's drawing on what kinds of resentments or grievances and who's not. I mean, there's enough blame to go around. There's enough, it lands out the right word. There's enough you know, ambiguity to go around in here. That'd be careful about drawing too strong of a line in your interpretation but there's enough here to say this is really interesting in terms of what's going on and who's claiming status or who's claiming um, power to demand or to resist or to say no. That's my guess. Joy. I appreciate that, Matt. Uh, um, and also Caroline's listing of all of those biases that we need to be exposed in different ways, both of your um, responses uh, line up with the question of how do we interpret this in a way that is consistent with the system that we want to dismantle? The othering system, the, the system that says we classify Jesus, we classify her, as opposed to, in this point, unlike last week, moving toward the gospel that where she is one, recognizing the story or the promise of God before the encounter of Jesus, and therefore her encounter of Jesus is leaning on this promise. Um, I, yeah, I, I, I want to dismantle the system when I'm uh, reading this, not, not always use it to, to show proof of the system. Which takes persistence. 
which is one other thing uh, that I, one other thing, and then we need to move on. But uh, I really appreciated that about the commentary on the website, uh, that a powerful pair here is persistence and faith. Uh, and the way in which uh, faith, uh, the nature of faith is this, this uh, persistent, persistence uh, in the face of, of uh, opposition. And so um, we are in a time of, of much needed persistence and that dismantling of those cultural, ethnic, political, economic, religious uh, biases and realities uh, are going to take a great amount of um, great amount of persistence. All right, the... Uh, Can I say one thing before, are you about to transition to us to a new text? Yes. I, I could hear it in your voice. Can I say one thing? Uh, it's just, we might, a preacher might want to look forward then and note that we are close to chapter 16, where Jesus will let out the who do people say that I am question and will present a new vision or at least an unexpected vision of what it means for him to be Messiah and will I'm not sure he's dismantling, but he certainly is moving away from some of these old divisions. And we still are not to the point of the story where we're able to yet realize, if we're walking through it chapter by chapter, just how big this is going to be and how it's going to have implications for all the nations, right? So one, one more thing. We have to preach the whole gospel. One more thing. We haven't said anything about the, those, those verses from 10 to 20 that Matt suggested that are permissible to read and we should read. Um, one of the really important things that's going on there is that um, Jesus is intentionally confusing two categories from Old Testament law. That is being defiled or unclean and being sinful. Um, it's really important to know that being unclean in, in say the laws in Leviticus is not to be sinful. Um, and we oftentimes assume it is, partially probably because of this text. Um, so there's a whole lot, I mean, I, I, I have to, I haven't wrestled enough with what I think about his confusion of those categories, but in a time of pandemic, when people are so afraid of being defiled, that is to get sick, this text resonates in a way um, with, um, you know, categories of sin and uncleanliness um, in ways that might really need to be unpacked. I really appreciate that, Ralph. Yeah, that that both tying it um, back to um, our current situation, as well as highlighting the fact that there is a distinction between um, what it means to be unclean and what it means to be sinful. Um, so thanks for bringing that up, um, Caroline. I don't know if you were going to go uh, here, but I I was uh, leaning into um, the um, question of the uh, First Kings text. Uh, in in terms of uh, you mean Isaiah, Joyce? I mean the Isaiah text. Yeah, as I scroll through and find out where I am. Yes, the Isaiah text in in terms of uh, the move away from the idea of the ritual to the right heart. Um, a right heart that would make this not pay attention to the house of prayer but that this is a house for all God's people. I don't know if that was where you were going to lean there, but. I was just going to move us to Isaiah in general. So that's great. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Uh, it's Isaiah 56. These first verses are um, some of the most powerful verses in all of Isaiah. It's the start of third Isaiah. Um, and what's really amazing, especially if you add verses, which of course I'm going to be in favor of, um, that what the prophet is doing is welcoming into the communion, uh, called here the congregation, uh, two groups of people who have been excluded based on Pentateuchal law, uh, that is eunuchs and foreigners. Now the verses, they cut out the part about the eunuchs, but uh, I think it's a mistake. I think... Uh, our people today can handle this just fine. Um, and the welcoming of these groups who have been legally um, kept out of the community, I think is, is really, uh, um, it's an important note in the ongoing expansion of the reign of Shalom and, and who 
is offered a place uh, in the community. And so I think that, that it's, you know, pretty helpful text with a lot of things we're wrestling with today. Should we go to the Genesis 45? So uh, you mentioned last week, uh, Rolf, that in only two Sundays, we have the whole Joseph cycle. How about that? <laughs> yeah, so you got a lot of ground to cover. That is, if you left Joseph, uh, just having been um, sold into slavery, and now you're going to take that whole cycle, um, it's, uh, it's a time to be a storyteller. Uh, really to unpack, you know, that all, everything that happens to Joseph in Potiphar's household, in prison, then when he's out, then how the brothers come down, of course, and, you know, and how Joseph tests them. There's so much going on that, that you have to get to. And then depending on how you want to tie up that story um, with, um, with Joseph here, I mean, Joseph in some ways is uh, like Esau uh, in earlier chapters here that he, you know, basically um, forgives the brothers and um, in this act of kissing his brothers and weeping with them and uh, overlooking the, uh, the, a sin that I couldn't ever forgive if somebody did it to me. Well, and he's really in a position of power here, isn't he? Wolf. I mean, it's, and so I think that that that's the larger question that I was thinking about with regard to this passage. I mean, yeah, you'd have to tell a lot, but it, but if, if you if you just focus on this particular passage and you say, okay, all right, by the way, all these things happen, but here we are, uh, and and Joseph is in this position of power, and so raises the question, what will you do with your power? Uh, what will you do with that? What will you do with that place of uh, that that position or or that that place with regard to your previous relationships, um, particularly relationships that, as you said, uh, uh, how do you how how do you even deal with that kind of betrayal and that kind of um, that kind of behavior? And yet uh, Joseph chooses reconciliation and peace. Uh, and so that's a that's I think that's a wider question of of how do we uh, that that does tell the reality of of what do we do in those kinds of situations i'm not sure i could do that same thing as you said rolf right i mean i don't know what but it but it does say wow this is this is what he chooses to do uh and, and instead of any kind of uh recompense or comeuppance or uh or anything along those lines yeah, Matt last week uh, brought up the line about uh, what shall become of his dreams. You know, and I think that might be a, a, a really good link, uh, you know, to, to tie the story together. What has, you know, what has become of Joseph's dreams? Um, you know, that is the dreams of his brothers bowing down before him that he had in Genesis 37 are fulfilled here, that dream. But but the, all those years in slavery and prison, you know, uh, did he imagine, you know, if he ever got the chance, um, what would he do? But partially because he has chosen to um, see God's activity in some way, I and mean, he overstates it, God did these to me. No, no, humans did them, but he sees the agency of God in there somewhere. Um, and he, like you said, chooses reconciliation. Um, I, myself, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, if uh, I'm sure anyone who's lived a significant amount of period in this world has had people that have done them harm that uh, you can't stop thinking about, uh, you, and it's hard to let it go. Uh, and, it, and this is an amazing story uh, to see what has become of Joseph's dreams. I, um, I, I've gone through this, um, personally, and um, I, I've gone through it socially, but I've also gone through it personally in my own family, uh, and um, had thought that I would, had, had thought I had reached the point, Ralph, that you were, where I would say I could not forgive. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, and was leaning into all of the lessons that say, you shouldn't even be asked to forgive. 
Um, and I will use the overuse of the language to say the work that God did in me to make it possible for me to hold on to the promise of God that was my dream. Um, and, and I think this idea, when Caroline was talking, I was thinking of what you're describing, Caroline, is the dismantling of the system, is that when you have the power, you do not perpetuate the power over system that kept you on the bottom, but that you, and, and I would say you submit this to the reign of God to be able to say that God's work in us makes it possible for us to say, I will be reconciled even with the ones who put me in this place. Um, if I were preaching this sermon, it would be very emotional. And I think that would be appropriate. <laughs> All right, Psalm 67. There is a, a commentary on the website by uh, Dr. Rolf Jacobson. Very fine commentary, Dr. Jacobson. Thank you very much. <laughs> I love that you turn this to uh, a recognition of this, um, uh, uh, that a benediction is for the sake of God's mission. And as much as I love the previous text, both for getting folks riled up or for expressing um, uh, my emotions, I would say your commentary says, make this the text you preach. Thanks, I appreciate that. I've said everything I have to say about this text on the website, so I just prefer people there. Or you could use it liturgically, which, um that would be another way to go. But I, but I think, uh, I, I mean, the, some of the connections that we're, that we're talking about in terms of uh, our discussion around Matthew and, uh, and who Jesus is and then what Joseph then chooses uh, over, as, as you said, Joy, over this perpetuation of, of destructive power. Uh, it, it, the way in which um, these characters are manifesting characteristics of God uh, and that God is gracious uh, and God is a God of blessing. And so it, it, it calls attention to, uh, it calls attention to the ways in which our own behavior, how does that match? Not that we are God, not that we can be God, but, uh, but the way in which does our, is our behavior godly uh, or is, is that a litmus test for how we think about going about in the world of graciousness and blessing? Uh, and, uh, and so that's, that's how I'm hearing the Psalm based on uh, our, the conversation that we've had so, more, so far about the text for this week. I still like the idea of liturgically, but I think it's a way to, um, I think it's a way to uh, think about, think about what, what, what is it that, uh, what is if our if we're truly committed to our God, uh, then then are our actions manifestations of graciousness and blessedness? So we and get to we, the end of Romans nine through eleven, which went fast. <laughs> three weeks on on three really really difficult chapters. The very beginning a spot in the middle, and now the very end of those. Since we're adding verses today, you should add verses 33 through 36 and get to the final doxology that, that concludes this section of Romans where Paul finally gets to the end of all of his cogitating back and forth about what is going on here. How can we make sense of the faithfulness of God even when all of Paul's kin or large numbers are not convinced that Jesus is the Messiah and Paul finally just goes to mystery and goes to uh, how wondrous are God's own workings, uh, and just is content to to sit in mysteries, content to sit in not knowing, and to deliver praise to God in the midst of that. And it ties in with uh, Caroline how you brought us out of the psalm in in terms of asking the question of what does our behavior look like. Um, um, is our testimony one that allows others to see? Christ in us uh, comes up out of this text. Um, but I, I think I'd linger um, with kind of the echoes for the Old Testament of 
uh, is God rejecting us? Um, in, in the midst of pandemic, in the midst of quarantine, in the midst of feeling like our agency has been removed, um, you want to ask the question, where is God in this? Is, is God angry with us? Is God rejecting us? And maybe that question that is a part, I, I should say it this way, I never saw that question in the text so prominently as I did as I read it this year. And I think too that 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 first uh, claim that Paul says, I asked then, has God rejected God's people? Uh, and and one of the I, it, particularly around uh, how is it that we talk about anti-Semitism in our pulpits, and uh, and and the the lingering claims or questions of good and faithful Christians about uh, what is going to happen to the Jewish people because they don't believe in Jesus. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I get that question so much when I do Bible studies and, and especially in, in recent, uh, in recent realities of our, of our society. And what, what I all, what I always call attention to is this passage uh, that, that to say that, uh, to make a claim about the judgment of of persons who don't believe in Jesus, and in this case, uh, the 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 Jewish people, is to say God God rejects God's own people. That's what you're saying. That God goes back on God's promises. What makes you think that God's going to then be true to you? And so, uh, be, be, so to get people to say when we make these claims about. Uh, and wondering about what's going to happen to uh, God's, you know, God's chosen people. You're not just making a claim about them. You are making a claim about God. Uh, and um, has God rejected God's own people? And Paul says, by no means. And as you said, Matt, yes, it, it, this mystery. But at the end of the day, uh, to make anything that says that about God uh, actually goes back on um, who God has, who God has demonstrated God's self to be.